There are very few things in this world that I love more than driving on a sunny day with the wind in my hair. But sometimes, when driving a convertible, you might feel a little too exposed. Well, the solution for your issues might be found in the vehicles of yesteryear. When the automobile was invented, all cars were convertibles. Or actually, not convertibles, but they were all topless. And, and up next to the, the stage, the Ben's Patent Wagon. wagon. It was a luxury to add a canopy to your vehicle, to shield you from the elements on your drive. I've always found it crazy that some turn-of-the-century vehicles had a roof for the wealthy vehicle owner, but no roof for the often underpaid driver. The unlucky driver also got the less preferred fabric of leather seats, while the inside passengers got cloth. Funny how history has reversed itself, and leather is the more luxurious option, and the wealthy drive cars with no roof. Pre-World War II, convertibles existed, but they were pretty basic. After the war is where things started to get interesting. While fighting in Europe, a group of soldiers took notice of the small sports cars seen on the streets like Jaguars and MGs. They agreed that when they got back to the States, they would build their own American versions of those sports cars. And when they arrived home, they did just that, naming their company the American Sports Car Company, or Tasco for short. Not the most creative name, but hey, sometimes naming a thing is the hardest part. They wanted to build a small car that would compete at Watkins Glen in New York. Tasco hired Gordon Bierig to design the car. Bierig was also responsible for the Cord 810, the first car to have pop-up headlights from one of my previous video essays. Tasco's first prototype is the vehicle you see here. It was built in 1948 and sat on a modified Mercury chassis. It also featured a flathead engine, expressive wheel arches, and most importantly, plexiglass T-tops. The T-tops help the sports car retain its rigidity, but also offer the open-air experience of those European sports cars. Tasco made one car, which no one really cared about, so the idea and the company was scrapped. However, before the lights shut off for the last time, Bierig patented his T-top design on June 5th, 1951. The world wouldn't see T-tops make a comeback until nearly 20 years after Tasco's failed project. In 1968, Chevy brought out the C3 Corvette, which featured T-tops. At the time of design, Bierig still owned the patent for T-tops, so he sued Chevy for using his design. They settled outside of court for an unknown amount of money, but whatever the amount was, Bierig allowed them to continue producing the T-tops. But let's pause here for a second. Let's get some vocab out of the way, with some help from one of my favorite little cars, the Suzuki Cappuccino. This is a hard top. No openings, no sunroof, just metal above your head, and that's it. This can also be called a slick top. These are T-tops. The name comes from the fact that a center bar remains in place for structural rigidity and to make the actual top smaller and easier to remove. Target tops are the same concept as a T-top, but leave no center bar after the roof is removed. Finally, here is a full convertible. No rear glass behind you, just your windshield and your neck are the rollover zones. This will come into play later. Target tops were pioneered around the same time as T-tops, being tested by Fiat in 1957 and Triumph in 1961, but it didn't get its name until 1965, when Porsche offered it on their 911. They named it after the Targa Florio, a road race in Sicily that Porsche had won a handful of times. But of course, like every other topic in the series, the T-tops and Target tops hit their stride in the 1970s and 80s. At their original conception, T-tops were stylish, fun, and helped retain a little bit of structural integrity for the car. But in the 1970s, the US government started a campaign to make cars safer after being pressured to do so for most of the 1960s. On December 31st, 1970, 
Congress founded the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This administration is responsible for the American Vehicle Safety Standards, CAFE laws on fuel economy, they implemented VIN numbers, as well as they even set the regulations for crash tests and insurance cost information. My first video essay was about the 55 mile an hour speedometers in the 1970s and 80s, a direct result from the new safety administration, as well as the fuel crisis. So how do the T-tops factor into this? Well, with the introduction of crash tests, testing and this newly founded safety administration, no one knew what was going to be required next. Factoring in the gas crisis, it seemed as though vehicle requirements were changing by the minute. To prepare themselves, car makers started opting for T-tops as opposed to full convertibles just in case safety standards got more strict. There never actually ended up being a law against convertibles or anything, but car makers decided it would better to be safe than sorry. And they had good reason. My fifth video essay was about power seatbelts, and to sum up that video shortly, the government said you either needed automatic seatbelts, whether that be powered or attached to the door like this Chevy's Cavalier, or you needed airbags. But then President Reagan took office and no longer required that law, so all the R&D was thrown out the window. No one knew what was going to be required next. This made T-tops a staple throughout the 1970s and 80s and well into the 1990s. But what happened to them? They were the safer option, right? Cars today don't come with T-tops. While there is no law preventing them, I have my theories. This is my own speculation, so I'd love to hear your theories in the comments section down below. Safety technology has progressed quite a bit. Convertibles have more robust rollover protection systems. Hardtop convertibles exist now, offering even more protection. Airbags and seatbelts are common practice. And honestly, there is no longer a big rush for vehicle safety, at least in terms of physical design. Yes, safety systems like blind spot monitoring and pre-collision alerts are rocketing forward, but car roofs are no longer at the forefront of the conversation. We know how to make safe convertibles, which was a questionable endpoint in the 1970s and 80s. If you ask anyone who owns an older car with T-tops, the topic of leakage always comes up. It's either, my T-tops leak, or I can't believe my T-tops don't leak. Furthermore, when removing the T-tops, you must store them somewhere. This can lead to them getting damaged or lost, which results in you no longer having a roof. I hope you don't live somewhere where the weather changes. When I say they're not cool anymore, I mean in the public eye. I got a lot of crap for saying that pop-up headlights are no longer cool, but what I meant was in the public eye and in terms of vehicle designers. They want to be on the cutting edge and pop-up headlights and T-tops no longer are. T-tops are incredibly cool to me, but they are a retro feature and when companies design a brand new car, they want it to feel all new, not 30 years old. Now close your eyes. T-tops. What did you just picture? I bet it wasn't from the last 30 years, and I'll bet it even included a mustache and a trunk full of cores. So, T-tops are no longer around. That's not to say roof technology is boring. The current ND Miata has a power fastback, which is really a power target top, and keeps the dream alive. However, there was something special about those little panels from the 1970s and 80s. I hope you guys enjoyed my latest video essay. This is my seventh one, and I'm so happy to see you guys enjoying them. If you have a topic for me, please leave it in the comments. I'll leave you with some of my previous work, as well as a playlist of all of my video essays circling around the 1970s and 80s car designs. Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next episode.